any superstar on this planet. And God, I thank you that at the name of Jesus, demons tremble. I thank you that at the name of Jesus, healing flows. I thank you that at the name of Jesus, people are sanctified and satisfied and peaceful and joyful. And Lord, they're uplifted and undergirded, they're strengthened, they're helped, they're protected, they're provided for. Lord, in the name of Jesus, all things are possible. Lord, I thank you that you've given us that weapon in our arsenal, that when we pray in the name of Jesus, you said, whatever you ask the Father in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you shall ask anything in my name, I'll do it. Father, we just come in the name of Jesus, and we present to you the needs that are represented. I lift up Bill Bushnell. God, as he's in hospice care, Lord, it looks like the end is near, but actually the beginning is about to start. And Lord, I thank you it's not an end. It's just a new beginning. And I pray for Sandy. I pray, God, you'd strengthen her. Father, physically, spiritually, emotionally, in every way, give her, Lord, the grace of God to endure what she's going through. And, Lord, we lift up Patty Besley, and, Lord, we lift up Stacy's mom and her dad as well. We thank you for the positive report that we heard on Sunday, but we're not going to give up praying. Elijah sent the servant out who saw the cloud the size of a man's hand, and, and although he was assured of an answer, he continued to seek you. God, we're assured that you're on the throne, but we're going to continue to pray. Lord, we curse that cancer completely, not partially, not a little bit, not just a speck gone here or a speck gone there, but Lord, take it all. Lord, bring peace to the family and bring, Lord, comfort to the home. And God, do a miracle, we pray in the name of Jesus. Lord, for those that are recovering, Lord, for Sharon, Lord, I thank you that you protected her even though she fell. It could have been worse. And I thank you for your hand of keeping upon her. I pray you'd help her in the healing process as well. God, I pray, Lord, tonight that you would just continue to be with Bill Ratz. And, Lord, Father, is, Lord, they're going to be able to help him with medication, maybe without surgery. They're going to try. I pray that, God, you'd intervene, that, Lord, he wouldn't need surgery. God, you're able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think. And in your name, all things are possible. Not in our name but in your name. Lord, tonight I pray for everybody representing any kind of a need that I may not be aware of, but you're well aware of. Those with colds, those with other common ailments, God, that, Father, we don't need to deal with because you already dealt with it, Calvary. God, I pray for your touch. Lord, I pray, God, tonight you'd manifest your glory one more time. We say thank you for Sunday. 
Thank you for coming down among your people and tabernacling in the midst of your congregation. Lord, you want to meet with us every time we gather. Father, you said where two or three are gathered in your name, you're in the midst of them, so we know you're here again tonight. And Lord, I pray, God, we would enter in and we would, Lord, allow your word to enter into us. God, I pray we would not leave the way we arrived. I pray we'd be transformed and changed into the image of Christ. Lord, thy kingdom come, thy will be done is our prayer and our desire. And we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Before you sit down, greet somebody and let them know you're glad they're in God's house. Amen. Praise God. How many are glad they're in God's house, by the way? Amen. You can't tell somebody else you're glad they're here if you're not glad you're here. Hallelujah. Praise God. Just a couple of announcements. Women for Christ. This Friday night, the day after tomorrow, Friday night, the 11th of November, craft night right here at the church, and uh, that will be at 6 o'clock, so mark that down, ladies, 6 o'clock, craft night, Friday night, then Women for Christ and Jeremiah Men's Ministry are joining forces and having our Christmas party here on Friday, December 2nd. That's at 6.30, and please sign up in the main foyer if you want to be here. We need to have a head count. We need to know how to plan and how to prepare, and so please mark that down. One other announcement is if you have to miss one Sunday, guess what? You didn't want to miss last Sunday. You don't want to miss this Sunday, amen? Also, we're going to be giving away blessing boxes for Thanksgiving. I think we're good for, for packing them, but if you can help deliver on Monday, please see Pastor Brendan ASAP. Amen. See him tonight. Amen. And I believe that's all the announcements we have tonight. Men's breakfast is Saturday, 8 o'clock. And if you can be here early and help cook or set up, be here a little earlier than 8 o'clock. 6 o'clock they get here and start. And that's on Saturday. So men, that mark that down. And the plan to be here Saturday morning. Amen. I believe that's all the announcements that I have at this time. So if you turn in your Bibles tonight to the book of Action, chapter 22, Acts 22, we're going to pick up at verse 1. Paul has been brought in by the Roman guard as the Jews have attacked him and he's spoken to the Romans in the Greek language and he said, is it lawful to scourge a, a Roman citizen without a fair trial? And so they said no. And uh, now we come to chapter 22. And he says, Men and brethren, and fathers, hear ye my defense, which I make unto you. This is Paul's defense to the Jews. And when they heard that he spake in the Hebrew tongue, now he spoke in the Greek language to the Romans, but when he addressed the Jews, he spoke in the Jewish language, the Hebrew tongue. And when they heard that he spake in the Hebrew tongue, they kept the more silence, and he saith, I am verily a man which am a Jew born in Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, and yet brought up in this city, which is Jerusalem, and at the feet of Gamaliel, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, and was zealous toward God, as ye all are this day. And I persecuted this way unto death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. And also the high priest doth bear me witness, and all the estate of elders from whom also I received letters unto the brethren, and went to Damascus to bring them which were bound unto Jerusalem for to be punished. And it came to pass 
that as I made my journey and was come nigh unto Damascus about noon, suddenly there shone from heaven a great light around about me. And I fell unto the ground and heard a voice saying unto me, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And I answered, Who art thou, Lord? And he said unto me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. And they that were with me saw indeed the light and were afraid, but they heard not the voice of him that spake unto me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said unto me, Arise and go into Damascus, and there it shall be told thee of all things which thou art appointed for thee to do. And when I could not see for the glory of that light, being led by the hand of them that were with me, I came into Damascus. And one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good report of all the Jews which dwelt there, came unto me and stood and said unto me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. And the same hour I looked up upon him. And he said, The God of our fathers hath chosen thee, that thou shouldest know his will and see that just one, and shouldest hear the voice of his mouth. For thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And it came to pass that when I was come again to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance and saw him saying unto me, Make haste and get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. And I said, Lord, they know that I am imprisoned and beat in every synagogue, or I imprisoned and I beat them in every synagogue that believed on thee. And when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by and consenting unto his death and kept the raiment of them that slew him. And he said, that's Jesus, Depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. And they gave audience unto his word and then lifted up their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for it is not fit that he should live. And as they cried out and cast off their clothes and threw dust into the air, the chief captain commanded him to be brought into the castle and bade that he should be examined by scourging that he might know wherefore they cried and so against him. And as they bound him with, with thongs, Paul said unto the centurion that stood by, Is it lawful for you to scourge a man that is a Roman and uncondemned? And when the centurion heard that, he went and told the chief captain, saying, Take heed what thou doest, for this man is a Roman. Then the chief captain came and said unto him, Tell me, art thou a Roman? And he said, Yea. And the chief captain answered, With a great sum obtained I this freedom. And Paul said, But I was free born. Then straightway they departed from him which should have examined him. And the chief captain also was afraid after he knew that he was a Roman and because he had bound him. And on the morrow, because he would have known the certainty whereof he was accused of the Jews, he loosed him from his bands and commanded the chief priest and all the council to appear and brought Paul down and set him before them. Father, give us wisdom as we dissect and, Lord, examine the word tonight. I pray, God, that, Lord, we would receive from your hand your truth, and your truth would make us free. And Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that you'd be glorified in this study, this teaching. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So in verse 1, Paul is preparing to go to his own defense. How many know sometimes you got to stand up for yourself? And as I spoke earlier, he spoke to the Romans in the Greek language, but now... He's addressing the Jews that have accused him, 
and he speaks to them in Hebrew, and when they realize that he's a Jew, what do they do? They stay quiet. They give him audience. They listen to him. And he begins to explain that he's a Jew that was born in Tarsus, which is a great city, but he was brought up in Jerusalem at the feet of a teacher named Gamaliel. Have you ever heard of Gamaliel? Gamaliel was the wise Pharisee that said at one point, leave them alone because if it's God, you don't want to fight God, and if it's not God, it will not come to pass. That's wisdom. How many know that you don't want to fight against God? And if it's not God, it's not going to work anyhow. Sometimes we need to take Gamaliel's advice when we deal with issues that come our way. Sometimes we just need to leave it alone and let God deal with it. You can't tear it down if God's building it up, and it's not going to be lasting if God didn't build it, except the Lord build a house. They labor in vain that build it. They may build it, but it won't last. It won't work. So Gamaliel was one of the greatest teachers of his time, one of the greatest rabbis in the Jewish faith. And Paul said, I was raised at the feet of Gamaliel, and uh, I was taught by him the strict attention to the law. And he explained to them, he said, I'm a zealot like you, I was a zealot like you are. If you turn to Philippians chapter number three, and we read verses four through six, it said, though I might also have confidence in the flesh, this is Paul's resume, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof that he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcise the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin and Hebrew of the Hebrews as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Amen. Paul, that's Paul's resume, and this is what he's explaining to the Jews. He's saying, I was just like you. I was taught according to the law by one of the greatest teachers of our time. I was a zealot. I persecuted the Christians. I killed them. I had them thrown in prison. In verse 4, he says, he said, I persecuted this way unto the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. And then he goes on in verse 5, he said, Also, the high priest doth bear me witness. I'm not just giving you my version, but even the high priest acknowledged me. And all the estate of elders, all the Pharisees, all the Sanhedrin, from whom I received letters unto the brethren, and I went to Damascus to bring them which were bound unto Jerusalem for to be punished. I was given marching orders by the Sanhedrin to do this. This is how zealous I was for the law. This is how much I was involved in keeping the law. I'm not just somebody that is throwing caution to the wind. I'm not just somebody that is ignoring the Jewish culture and the Jewish customs. I was raised the way you're raised. I did what you do. Even the high priest and the Sanhedrin were involved in what I did, and then he begins to change the subject. He lays the groundwork by giving his Jewish resume, by giving his Pharisee resume, by giving his, his, uh, his reputation as being a, a zealot for the law. But now in verse 6, things turn, and he said, It came to pass that as I made my journey, he was laying the groundwork by explaining to them that he wasn't taking the law for granted because they were saying that he was preaching against the law. They were saying that he was teaching them that they didn't have to keep the law. And so he laid the groundwork by telling them his background. Now he says, It came to pass that as I made my journey and was come nigh unto Damascus at about noon, 
suddenly there shone from heaven a great light round about me. He begins to tell them about his Damascus Road encounter and as he's traveling at about noon, what a great time to meet Jesus, midday. Amen? You're awake enough to know it's him and you still have the rest of the day to think about it. And at noon, all of a sudden, what happens to him at noon? Verse 6. A great light shone about me, and it talked. How many know that in John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth after me shall not walk in darkness. You know, the, how many have ever talked to anybody or heard people that have had an out-of-body experience? They always say they saw a light. They, they went and saw a great light. Well, what they, what they were getting a vision of was a glimpse of the glory of Jesus. And how many know we're all going to stand before him? When, when we die, we're all going to give an account some are going to give an account at the beam of judgment and some at the great white throne. But all of us are going to stand before the light who brings exposure to the darkness. And about noon, he sees this bright light. It's all around him. And in verse 7, it says what? What happened to him? He fell on the ground and what? Heard a voice saying, what? Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? How many know that God knows where you're at and he knows your name? Don't think that you are escaping his sight. <coughs> the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. <coughs> and Jesus said, it. why do you persecute me, Saul? What, what do we refer to happening to Saul in our modern Pentecostal church what would you say happened to him he was slain in the spirit he was slain in the spirit what does it mean to be slain in the spirit don't all speak at once to be overcome by the Holy Spirit It's the overpowering presence of Jesus Christ. John 18 and verse 6, when they came to arrest Jesus in the garden, they, he said, who are you looking for? They said, Jesus. And the, verse 6 said, as soon as they, he had said that, he said, I am he. What happened to the guards? They went backward and did what? They fell to the ground. They were slain out. It was the overpowering presence of God. Amen? The overpowering presence of God. I was preaching in a church, very large church, and on one particular night, Somebody got slain out, and I wasn't even praying for them. They just fell out. And they fell on someone who was kneeling beside them. And the next thing I know, the pastor's making a beeline to the altar, calling me out. And he said to me, he said, I hope your insurance is paid up. I said, what? He said, uh... That's your fault. Somebody just fell on somebody kneeling there and that person's going to the hospital right now. He'd had a lawsuit that year from a softball game and he was afraid of a lawsuit. He said, and you did this because you were talking about people getting slain out so you put it in that person's head. He said, that's not biblical. They're either in rebellion or it's not God. I said, yeah, I understand. That's why uh, 
John the Revelator fell at his feet as if dead. He was in rebellion. Well, we did finish the crusade, and there was no lawsuit given. But I want you to know it's a biblical practice. But it doesn't matter how you go down. It matters how you get up. And if you don't get up changed and having an encounter, so what if you went down? And if you go down in the flesh, I pray you get hurt. What? Yeah, because we don't need people bringing shame to the cause of Christ. Amen? I've seen people go down and smack pews. I've seen them go down and bang into posts in the middle of the room. I've seen them go down playing guitars. I've seen them go down as couples. I've seen mothers go down with babies in their arms. I've seen, you name it, we've seen it. And I want to tell you, if it's God, you're not going to get hurt. Up in Geneseo, one crusade, I remember a man who'd had back trouble and he was on receiving disability. He was uh, on uh, unemployment because of his back. I prayed for him and he went down like a ton of bricks. His back went right onto the front wooden pew and he hit hard. And when he came to, guess what? He was healed. No more pain in the back. Because if it's God, you won't get hurt. Amen? And I believe that. I've seen it many, many times. I've seen it over and again. But it's the overpowering presence of God. And when Jesus told them, I'm, he, I'm him, then they fell to the earth. Revelation 1.17. John said, and when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. And then in 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 10 and 11, And it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priests could not stand to minister. Kind of happened to Pastor Brendan on Sunday and Brother Dave up on the platform. They couldn't stand anymore because of the cloud, because the glory that came down. The glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. What it is, it's simply the overpowering presence of God. I remember in one church, the big old farm boy came up to me and everyone was f falling out under the power and he looked at me and he stood there and planted his feet planted himself, and he said, well, preacher, I'm not going down. I said, I don't care. I'm not here to make you go down, but I will pray for you. And when I prayed for him, bam, all of a sudden, he went down, and this boy was a big boy, and he planted himself. But I want to tell you, God's saying to him, don't you challenge me, son. We'll find out who really has the power, amen? And, you know, we used to put a premium on falling out like it was spiritual. It can be a spiritual event, but that depends on what kind of an encounter you have when you're down. If nothing happens when you go down, it's like a sinner getting baptized in water. He goes down a dry sinner, he comes up a wet sinner. If you get slain out and you don't have an encounter with God, so what if you fell down? I want to know how straight you walk when your feet hit the floor. Amen. I want to know how you stand, not how you fall. And when you go down, God will minister to you. God will do something. He'll humble you. He'll speak to you. He'll direct you. He'll correct you. He'll do something. But somehow or other, God doesn't waste his, his time just knocking you down to knock you down. What he was showing the guards when he arrested them, listen, I am God. I am Jesus. And I'm going to show you because my power is going to put you right on the ground and you're going to realize that you're dealing with a power bigger than yourself. Sometimes God allows us to fall out so we realize how big he is. How many know God's a big God? 
And so here's Saul. He gets slain out, falls out under the power of God, and he hears this voice talk. God didn't just knock him down to knock him down. He knocked him down to get his attention. And he said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? What a question. And he said, who is this? Who art thou, Lord? He didn't know who it was. But when Jesus answered, he said, I am Jesus of Nazareth whom thou persecutest. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he explained to the Jews as he's telling his story of what happened on the Damascus Road. He said, this power knocked me down. This light was so bright. He said, but those that were with me, my companions, in verse number 9, he said, they that were with me saw indeed the light and were afraid, but they didn't hear the voice of him that spoke to me. God spoke specifically to me. God knocked me down. God picked me out. God chose me. God singled me out of the pack because he had a message he needed to communicate to me. He let the others know he was there, but I was the one he wanted to talk to. How many know that sometimes God wants to get a private conversation with us? I like the private conversations with him myself. You don't have to be afraid to have a private conversation. Even if he's going to correct you, he'll do it in a way where you say, thank you very much, Lord. How many have ever met somebody that could correct you and you walk away saying thank you? They just had a way of correcting you, and you're thanking them for correcting you. Well, that's the way God works. He can correct you and do it in such a way where you feel good about it. Not where you're hurt and you're beat and you're, you're chastised, but you are put on the right path. They saw the light, but they didn't hear the voice. And so he said, okay, Lord, I know who you are now. What do you want me to do? What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said unto him, Rise, go into Damascus, and there it shall be told thee of all the things which are appointed for thee to do. I think I'd be asking the same question if God knocked me down like that. What do you want me to do? Amen? What do you want me to do? So what did Jesus tell him? He didn't say, This is what I want you to do and lay out his life right away. He said, go to Damascus, and then you'll find out. Sometimes we got to live a life of faith and walk a faith walk. Sometimes with God, it's one step at a time. He doesn't always lay everything out before us. Sometimes he's like with Abraham, get thee up out of thy country, away from thy kindred, out of thy father's house, into a land that I will show thee. You just take one step, and I'll tell you when to take the next one. First thing I want you to do, Paul, or Saul at the time, is I want you to go into Damascus. Just finish where you, where you started for. Get to your destination. I'm not changing your travel plans. And when you get there, then we'll change your itinerary. Then we'll change your purpose and we'll change your plans. And in verse, verse number 11, he goes on and he said, and when I could not see, why? Why couldn't he see? Because of the glory of the light, being led by the hand of them that were with me, I came into Damascus. Blinded by the light. Amen. Blinded by the light. The light was so bright it blinded him and he had to be led. Exodus 33 and verses 18 through 20. I don't have them on, I don't have that on the screen, but let me read. Moses said to the Lord, He said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. That word is luminous, lumen, brightness. And God said to him, 
I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. How many have ever been told never to look directly at the sun? Because it will blind you. How many know there's a sun brighter than the sun? The S-O-N is brighter than the S-U-N. First Thessalonians chapter number 2 and verse number 8. Let me get there quickly. 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 8 says this. So being affectionately desirous of you. Well, that's 2 Thessalonians, rather, chapter 2 and verse number 8. Not 1 Thessalonians. Sorry about that. In flaming fire. No, that's. And then shall that wicked, here we are, and then shall that wicked be revealed, 2 Thessalonians 2, 8, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. No man will see me and live. There's such a brilliance to God's glory that you can't look on him and live. And when... Paul or Saul saw the brightness of his glory to the extent he saw it, it blinded him. It blinded him. And he said the light was so bright I couldn't even see. And so those that were with me, my traveling companions, led me into Damascus. And in verse 12 it said, And when I got there, one named Ananias, a devout man, and I believe that's very appropriate that he was a devout man one that could be trusted according to the law having a good report of all the Jews this was not a fly by night that God chose to go to Saul Ananias a devout man according to the law and he's sharing this with the Jews who were so worried about the law he's telling them that the man that came to him was devout concerning the law and had a good report of all the Jews which dwelt there. And I believe he threw that in there for their benefit to know that he was, he was above reproach here. In verse 13, what does Ananias say? He came unto me and he stood and he said unto me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. I don't think Ananias wanted to call him Brother Saul at first, if you read the account. He said, I've heard about this guy. I don't want to go. I don't want to go and tell him anything. I, I don't want to go near him. I've heard how he kills Christians, and I want to keep my distance from him. But God told Ananias to go, and his words to Saul are, Brother Saul. How many of you could call a man a brother who was coming to kill you? Who's our new pastor? Oh, the guy that was coming to kill us. We just going to elect him as the new man in charge. The guy that wanted to execute us, he's going to be our new pastor. He's going to be our new preacher. We're going to put him in the pulpit. Brother Saul, welcome to town. So glad you're here. But I think Ananias had some reservation, and it wasn't all that easy for him. But he obeyed anyhow, didn't he? Brother Saul. We're going to be calling people brother and sister that aren't as pretty as we think they ought to be or as holy looking as they ought to be in our eyes, in our estimation. How many know that it doesn't matter the outward appearance? It matters the heart. Saul had a change of heart. And all that Ananias knew is God told him to do it, and so he was willing and obedient to do what he was instructed to do. 
And he said, receive thy sight. And what happened? The blind eyes came open. The blinders came off. And in verses 14 and 15, the Bible said, he said, the God of our fathers has chosen thee that thou shouldest know his will and see that just one and shouldest hear the voice of his mouth for thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. So what's Ananias say to Paul or Saul? God's called you to take this testimony and tell it to everybody you come in contact with. He wants you to share your testimony. He wants you to tell what God has done for you. Amen? How many can tell what the Lord has done for you? Does anybody here have a testimony? November 23rd, two weeks from tonight, testimony night. Amen? It's the night before Thanksgiving, and we're going to have testimony night, so come expecting to give a testimony. Amen? Brother Saul, here's what God has for you. He's going to use you to share your testimony, and he's going to take you to be a witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. In Acts 4 and verse 20, they told Peter and John not to talk about Jesus, and what did they say? We cannot but speak the things which we have both seen and heard. What was Saul supposed to tell? What he had seen and heard. So then the question that I'm going to ask you is this. Have you seen or heard anything lately? Sunday we got a little touch. Just a little touch. It wasn't mega touch. It was a little touch. How I many know you, there's a whole lot more of God to get? A whole lot more of him to have. And we need it. But how many have something that you've seen and heard that you can tell? You've heard, how many have had God speak to you? How many have had God reveal himself to you? And you knew it was God. Maybe you didn't see a physical form. Maybe you didn't see even a spirit form, but you just knew he was there and he revealed his presence. And he did it, and then he spoke a word to you and gave you a word. You'll hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk ye in. And how many know he still reveals himself? How many know you can still have a Damascus Road encounter? How many know this is not one and done, the only time it's ever going to happen? God still reveals himself to his people, and he'll still reveal himself to those who are not his children yet. So if you have unsaved loved ones, pray that God gives them a Damascus Road encounter. He reveals himself to them. He speaks to them. He shows himself to them. And then in verse 16, after he tells him, <coughs> you're going to go and share your testimony, he said, what are you waiting for? <coughs> you need to get up and get baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Does that mean baptism washes your sins away? No, it's a testimony your sins have been washed away. When were your sins washed away? When you called on the name of the Lord. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You need to call on God to forgive your sins and you need to be baptized and that will be an outward expression of an inward relationship. That will be your visible testimony. Then you're going to share your verbal testimony. But the visible testimony is your water baptism and your walk with God after you're saved. Amen? That's the tangible, expressible expression of your relationship with God. Acts 2 and 38. Somebody want to read that?
Repent and what? Be baptized. Why does Christ instruct us to be baptized? And why was Jesus baptized by John? This is Christianity 101, water baptism class. Jesus was our example, but when he was baptized, what happened? And the heavens were open, and a form of a dove came and sat upon him. And then a voice from heaven was heard that said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. It was a sign of God's approval on his life, and it was signifying that he was accepting the call that was put on his life. Amen? And why do we get baptized in water? I know I told you it's because it's a visible sign that we have been crucified with Christ and we're alive. But I'll tell you why we do it. Because it's expected of us to do. It's obedience to God. Now, can you get to heaven if you're not baptized in water? Yeah, the thief on the cross wasn't baptized in water. But if you have the opportunity to get baptized and you don't get baptized, that's not obedience to God. Because throughout Scripture, he tells you you need to be baptized. That's the outward expression of the inward relationship. That's outwardly saying, I have crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And so we need to be baptized because God instructs us to be baptized. It's an obedience to him. Amen? It's an obedience to him. And so Paul or Saul, you need to get baptized. In Acts 8, verses 36 and 37, this is the Ethiopian eunuch. And Philip had gone out into the desert and ministered unto him. And as they're going away, along the way, the Bible said they went their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me from being baptized? Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You see, you get baptized because you chose to believe. Being baptized doesn't make you a believer. It's a sign you are a believer. And what Ananias is saying to Saul, you need to give a visible demonstration that your life has changed and now you're a believer. You need to get baptized, Saul, so that what you say with your mouth is back, backed up with what you do with your life. So he has this instruction from Ananias. And then verse 17 goes on in our text and said, and it came to pass, he's still talking to the Jews. He's given his testimony. He said, it came to pass when I was come again to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple. After I left Damascus, I came back to Jerusalem. I prayed in the temple and I was in a trance. Remind you of anyone else? How about Peter when he was in a rooftop? Amen? And how many know that it was dinner time, but he fell into a trance and he had a vision of a sheet coming down out of heaven with all manner of four-footed creatures on it. And the voice said, Arise, kill, and eat. And Peter said, No, it's common. It's unclean. And God said, Well, I've cleansed. Don't you call unclean. And what was God doing with Peter? Peter? sending him to the house of Cornelius, a Gentile. What was God doing with Saul? Getting ready to send him to the Gentiles. And in verse 17, he's praying, he falls into a trance. And in verse 18, and I saw him saying unto me, make haste and get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, 
for they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. Now Jerusalem is where the temple was. It's where the center of worship was for the Jewish faith. And God is telling Saul, get out of town. They won't receive you. How many know the hardest people to reach are the religious crowd? Because they think they're all right. They think they've got it all together. And they're pharisaical. They look one way on the outside, but on the inside, it's a total different story. He said, they're not going to receive your testimony. In John chapter 1 and verse 11, it said what? Somebody want to read it? He came to his own, and his own received him not. Who was his own? The Jews. And he said, here in Jerusalem, they're not going to receive your testimony because they're not going to receive me. How many know what he said to Moses? They're not rebelling against you. They're rebelling against me. How many know when people reject your testimony, they're not rejecting you? They're rejecting the God who saved you. And that's what God is telling Saul. Get out of town. They're not going to receive. Shake the dust off your feet. And Paul tries to justify things. He thinks he knows more than God knows. In verse number 19, what does Saul say? Oh, they know that I'm like they are. They know how I imprisoned and beat every uh, beat in every synagogue them that believed on thee they know that I was a persecutor of the Christians they'll receive it they know where I came from they're they're going to trust me I was one of them how many know that even though you might have been one of them when you're no longer one of them they no longer receive you how many know what I'm talking about as long as you were in the party scene, you were life of the party, you were part of the party. But when no longer you attended their parties and partied with them, they didn't want to hear what you had to say. I remember when Forrest Butler got saved, the gentleman that lived behind the church in Bolton Landing that called me over drunk, and I dumped a quart of hard liquor and a case of beer down his drain, and he came to the church with me, walked in my office and gave his life to Christ. Forrest used to buy the last round for everybody every night at the bar. But after Forrest got saved, Forrest never darkened the door of the bar again and nobody wanted to hang out with him anymore. He wasn't buying the last round. You see, as long as you're one of them, they'll listen. But saying I used to be one of them so they know me once you're saved, you're not one of them. And there is going to be a difference. You know what the problem in a lot of our lives are? We want to hang on to our old relationships. Now, it's not wrong to have friends who aren't saved as long as you are influencing them more than they're influencing you. But if you're just wanting to hang out with the old crowd and do what you used to do, you can't do what you used to do once you walk with God. You're a new creature. Old things are passed away, and they're not going to receive you. Jesus is saying this to Saul. They're not going to accept you anymore. You're no longer one of them. Well, they know me. I, was, I walked with them. He said, I was even there when Stephen was stoned. They know me. But in verse 21 of our text, Jesus said unto me, depart, because I'm going to send you to the Gentiles. If the Jews aren't going to receive you, I'm going to send you to a people at will. And how many know that we've been grafted in as Gentiles? I thank God for Acts 10 more than Acts 2, because Acts 2 was Jewish Pentecost, but Acts 10 was Gentile Pentecost, and if Acts 10 didn't happen, I wouldn't be Holy Ghost filled. I thank God that he sent the message to the Gentiles as well. 
he said, get out of town. I'm sending it to the Gentiles. And so this is the testimony Paul is giving to the Jews. In verse 22, and I'm going to hurry to get through this. We only have a few more verses. They gave him audience unto his word and then lifted up their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for it's not fit that he should live. They said, We're going to kill him because he started talking about God sending him to the Gentiles and he was telling how God had sent him out of Jerusalem send him to the Gentiles, and now they want to kill him. He shouldn't live. Verses 23 and 24, And as they cried out and cast their clothes and threw dust into the air, the chief captain, that's the Roman guard, commanded him to be brought into the castle and bade that he should be examined by scourging that they might know wherefore they cried so against him. He said, get him away from those people. They're going to kill him. Get him away from the Jews. Let's bring him back to the castle where he can be safe. But let's find out exactly what's going on here. We'll beat him until he tells us what's going on. So now instead of being killed by the Jews, he's going to be tortured by the Romans. You got a choice, Paul. Which one do you want? Death or torture? You want to get whipped with shards of metal? And their violent response caused the chief officer to bring him up and to command the soldiers to question him by whipping him, which is truly torture. And while they're preparing to torture him in verse 25, how many know that Paul played the the political hand? He played politics. Sometimes it's not wrong to play politics. He turns to the guard that's about to beat him in verse number 25, and he said, as they bound him with thongs, Paul said unto the centurion that stood by, hey, is it lawful or is it legal for you to scourge a man that's a Roman and uncondemned? Verse 26 and when the centurion heard that he went and told heard that he went and told the chief captain saying take heed what thou doest for this man is a roman in verse 27 then the chief captain came and said unto him tell me art thou a roman and he said yes so in other words he's telling them i'm a roman citizen and this is against the roman law to beat a roman citizen who's not been condemned You haven't even had a trial. You're going to beat me before you even try me, and I'm a Roman citizen. Is that right? And when the chief captain heard this, he asked Paul, are you really a Roman citizen? And Paul said, yes. And when they learned that Paul was a Roman citizen, they shut down the scourging, and they were very fearful because they could have gotten in trouble for breaking their own law. But even though they didn't beat him, they still held him in captivity to be examined the next day by the chief priest and the Sanhedrin. Amen? So in other words, now Paul's escaped another beating, but he's been almost killed because of his testimony. His defense almost got him destroyed. But what happened here is this. He got to share his testimony with the Jews at Jerusalem. God opened the door for him to share his testimony where it never would have been shared any other way. Sometimes the way God opens doors for us to minister isn't the way we expect him to or the way we want him to. We think it should be everybody wants to hear me because I've got such a great testimony. They're all coming with open ears. And God's saying, I'm opening the door through an opportunity that is going to either take your life or save your life. It's life or death in this situation. And that's what's going to determine how my word is shared with these Jews. I'm going to get the word out one way or another. And if it comes through your discomfort, Paul, so be it. I'll protect you. 
I'll take care of you. And we'll hear more of that next time. He said, I'll get you to, I'll get you to Rome. That's where you want to go. I'm going to get you out of Jerusalem. It'll be all right. You'll make it to Rome. And you'll have an opportunity to share my gospel there as well. But it's going to cost you. How many are willing to lay your life down for the gospel's sake? Tough question, huh? But that's where Paul was. He said, I'm not only willing to be beaten, I'm willing to die. And he was able to share his testimony where he never would have had an opportunity to share it any other way. It's like Joseph going to prison. He never would have met the cupbearer to get in audience with the king if he didn't go to prison. Sometimes God's got to put you in the right circumstances to get the right result, and the right circumstances aren't what we consider the right circumstances. Sometimes it may be through tragedy. Sometimes it may be through brokenness. But God will always get glory out of your life if you let him use you for his glory. Amen? To be used of God to sing, to speak, to pray. To be used of God to show someone the way. I long so much to feel the touch of your consuming fire. To be used of God is my desire. How about you? Father, tonight I thank you for your word. And Lord, we can learn as we glean from reading the examples of those in Scripture. God, you have a way of doing things that are not our ways. Your ways are higher than our ways. Your thoughts are not our thoughts. And so, God, we submit our will to your will. And Father, whatever you need to do in us and through us, God, I pray, Lord, you'd use us for your glory and your honor. And I ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you tonight. Don't forget, Friday night, ladies' craft night, Saturday morning, men's breakfast. God bless you all.